water quality, he's a water quality specialist with USDA and RCS in Colchester. He provides technical support for and coordinates Vermont and RCS water quality projects and programs with the state and federal partners. These include statewide technical assistance and training on water quality and environmental issues, edge field monitoring, and agricultural conservation practices, watershed planning <coughs> and targeted watersheds, development of new practices to address emerging issues, and coordination of water quality projects with partners. Kip has 25 years of experience with NRCS and 35 years in water-related work. He holds a BA in Environmental Studies from Johnson, an MS in Natural Resource Planning from UVM, and a PhD in Forest Hydrology from Penn State. Uh, his talk is entitled Edge of Field Monitoring in Vermont. Thank you. There goes the last one minutes right there. <laughs> Um, 
it has now gone to a new national program, and there are several more states that are now uh, conducting it field monitoring using our environmental quality incentive program funds. Uh, we had eight projects that were funded in 2011 that started up in 2012, and we've been able to um, establish two new uh, field monitoring sites in the basin. Uh, through this program and one other um, project through another uh, NRCS funding source. We have uh, what we're calling activity standards rather than our traditional practice standards that provide all the technical criteria for conducting these monitoring programs. And we also have uh, established payment rates that provide a, a sort of a average flat rate payment for conducting this monitoring. And, and I should make clear that all this monitoring is done through uh, individual farmers, private landowners on a voluntary basis. Um, and the money is, and most of the money is going through them for this uh, program. Uh, we initially had a partner committee that established you know, priorities for monitoring and field monitoring in the state. And uh, we have been trying to uh, address those priorities. Um, a lot of objectives that could be uh, tied to this type of program. The two primary ones, um, of course, are the, the, probably the foremost one is that the program is intended to uh, quantify the uh, treatment effects of selected agricultural and conservation practices. Um, as part of that, you'll also um, get uh, you quantify what the baseline conditions are from farm fields. Uh, those are the two primary objectives. Um, as we get into this, as we've gotten into this program, we find that there are also other multiple benefits associated with this type of program. Um, everything from providing uh, information for modeling to um, increasing public and farmer awareness around this issue and getting, getting them more involved in water quality data and its collection. I want to make, make um, uh, sure that uh, I emphasize you know, the partner contributions that went into this because it really is a multi-partner uh, effort. And as I mentioned, uh, most of the money, the majority of the money is coming through NRCS to farmers. Uh, we also have support from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture Food and Biotechs. They provided some money and administrative support. Uh, we've done matching funds through the Lake Champlain Basin Program, mostly Great Lakes Fisheries Commission funds. So we've actually been able to implement these projects on farms at no cost to the farmers, which is very important since it's a voluntary program. Uh, Vermont DEC is pro providing lab services to run all these uh, samples. And uh, Stone Environmental was actually contracted to uh, 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 install and operate monitoring stations and analyze the data. So these are our first initial uh, eight projects. We had uh, uh, seven projects, uh, six farms, excuse me, uh, scattered throughout the, the basin. Uh, since this, uh, we just had two new projects, three new projects going in this fall. One was in the Minor Institute on the New York side, one's in Shelburne, and then we've got another one up in Franklin. Practices that we are currently about evaluating include uh, cover crops, uh, manure injection on hay, uh, drainage water management, which is, uh, is a new practice in this area. It's used extensively in the Midwest. And uh, we're also looking at um, systems of practices where we can too. So one of the ones of primary interest is a system of reduced tillage or no-till manure injection and cover crops. So all those practices will be implemented on the same field within the same year. And we do have a, a brand new one that just went in uh, that's looking at a phosphorus removal system on a tile line from an ag field. We're using for most of these the classic, Jamie mentioned earlier, the classic paired watershed approach where we, we have two uh, similar uh, watersheds that we monitor um, without any treatment practices for a period of a couple of years. And then on the treatment watershed, we implement the practice and then monitor uh, both watersheds. 
Uh, the, the strength of this type of procedure is they can control for the effects to, of weather to a great extent. Um, and what we're hoping, um, we're still uh, in the, the um, we're in the control, um, we've completed the control period for our original uh, six, seven watersheds, uh, and we're currently in the treatment period for those, and we just started the uh, control period for the two new ones. And this is the type of data that you're, you're hoping uh, to be able to get out of this, is, you know, you run it during the um, control period for several years, establish a relationship, uh, in this case phosphorus, between your control watershed and your treatment watershed, and then you add your treatment uh, monitor for a couple more years and determine what that relationship is, and the difference is your treatment effect. So, really powerful experimental design. Um, we're monitoring a variety of parameters. Uh, we're using traditional type monitoring equipment, um, ISCO samplers, um, and uh, H-flumes. Uh, what you can't see, you know, since these are the edge of fields, um, there's often not a stream associated with the field at this point. So we're actually having to build burners to make sure that runoff, service runoff from the field is entered through the flume. And I should mention that these initial projects are looking only at surface runoff. Uh, we do have the ability and, and plan on uh, looking at subsurface runoff in the future when we can get some more projects uh, online. Uh, we're um, collecting uh, flow proportional composite samples so that we uh, have one sample uh, for each storm event and we determine event mean concentration, decreases your sample frequency and, and costs uh, significantly. And as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, you know, our original seven projects that are nearing completion, and then two new ones uh, that have just come online, and then putting a new phosphorus removal system. So these are some of the, some of the sort of baseline results for, for phosphorus. Uh, we'll just let it go with phosphorus in a minute for the sake of time. Um, you can see that these are events, uh, mean, uh, means for the events from these various stations. And we had uh, six corn sites and six hay sites. And you can see uh, the means for the corn are running you know, from around 300 to over 1,000 micrograms per liter. Uh, to give that some perspective, the in-lake goals for the lake range from 10 to 25 micrograms per liter. So we're looking, you know, these are an order of magnitude or higher or greater than what we'd like to see in our surface waters. The hay sites are somewhat lower for total phosphorus, uh, but um, what we're finding is that um, dissolved phosphorus is, is, is much greater uh, in the runoff than what we expected. Overall, 65% of the total phosphorus leaving the sites is in the dissolved form. Um, and that, of course, our hay sites, which are this one, these here, uh, are showing a higher percentage of dissolved, but even our corn sites um, are showing a very high percentage of dissolved phosphorus. Uh, this, this shows um, a relationship between soil phosphorus and what we're seeing in runoff, very strong correlation. And uh, I need to wrap up here one minute. <laughs> I, I think um, some of these I've already gone over. But you know, we're seeing um, you know, very, very high uh, soluble phosphorus levels. Uh, total phosphorus was higher from our cornfields as expected. Um, and, but dissolved phosphorus was higher from our hay fields. And, and a strong correlation between soil P levels and what we're seeing in runoff. Some of the early implications of this, um, you know, the, and one, one thing I didn't point out is uh, one of the hay fields actually had our highest uh, event mean concentration over 15,000 micrograms per liter. And that, that was from a storm event where the farmer was actually out applying manure when it started raining. So, um, 
So we are seeing some of the highest concentrations of hay fields, uh, and there's at least to be better guidelines, you know, provided to farmers about timing of manure application. Um, and, yep, sorry. Uh, also, hay fields can, can contribute significant amounts of soluble phosphorus to surface waters. And the soluble P is a major source of phosphorus from these ag fields, and it really has implications as the type of practices that we should be recommending. Traditionally, NRCS and other um, ag partners have been focused on erosion control measures. They deal for primarily with particulates and phosphorus associated with those particulates. But we need to be looking at other practices that address soluble phosphorus runoff more, more directly. Um, and you know, just the managing of soil P levels is very important. So you know, we need our plants you know, to continue additional monitoring into the future. We're going to try to focus. Uh, there's a lot of evidence uh, now out there uh, implicating tile drainage as a major source of phosphorus, especially soluble phosphorus. So we're going to be focusing um, a number of new projects uh, looking at tile drainage and practices that can uh, reduce phosphorus loading from tile. So that's it. Hopefully, we still have some time. We, do, yeah, we, have, we have uh, four minutes for questions. <coughs> Yeah, Jamie? Well, I'm curious whether you um, try to kind of figure the runoff of phosphorus stream in the area and compare that to what we're seeing in the rivers and if we're <laughs> on, on a loading or a flux basis, a breaker, a loading basis? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> <There's> Unfortunately, <laughs> these, these initial um, seven projects that we uh, started with, uh, we're not monitoring year round, so we don't have annual. Uh, you know, accurate estimates are those from the sort of back of the envelope calculations, but we don't have accurate estimates of annual loading rates. Our new projects, uh, we are required to operate those year round, so we will have some better loading rates. But do you have any sense that even if you just look at the concentrations, is what you see coming off the fields comparable to what you see in the rivers? Might there be attenuation between the edge of the field and then it finally makes it to a stream, or are there more sources? We've seen some pretty high concentrations in the streams too. Yeah, you know, um, I've measured some up around 500 micrograms per liter in some of the smaller streams in these ag areas. So, if you look at Brooklyn Dale today, have a very high um, concentration. <coughs> so, I'm not sure if there's a lot, a lot of attenuation going on between the fields and these first order streams. Thank you.